What you are about to witness is a fascinating interview with a gentleman called Christopher Spencer, or rather that is his pen name. He has to conceal his real name. In the following interview, Christopher speaks about his 50 plus years in the world of high level finance, both as a banker and a finance and investment broker. He covers everything from international espionage to covert financial agreements, con men, murder, war, and more, with a touch of personal flair. Everything you are about to hear is true. Some questions were pre-agreed and scripted to explain specific content in his books. Most are not. You can find details of where to buy his books in the video description below. This is part two. You mentioned that as a child, there was a time or a moment where you realized it would be better for you if your father was not in the picture so that you could go to school and be better educated. That's quite a mature decision for a young child to make. How old were you and how and why did you come to that decision? I think I, I came to that decision because uh, my schooling had been disrupted. I'd been to so many different schools as a result of him dragging us around the country. And I came to that decision when I was about 14, 15. I'd already lost a whole year's schooling and had to repeat it as a result. That's really quite mature for a 14 year old. Um, is that kind of characteristic of the kind of child you were? Yes, probably. Um, I uh, found that uh, I, I was quite good at school when I had the ability to go to school. I won a few form prizes and things like that. And education was very important to me, I suppose. And in later life, that also was important to me, education and taking further examinations and working hard at school. I mean, after the all, if you face a situation like I faced, you uh, have to be thrown back onto your ability to work and to study, work and study, if you're going to extract yourself from that difficult, those difficulties. I think too many people give up I think they've got to work very hard and they've got to study hard in order to make something of themselves. Yeah, I would say in a lot of areas of our culture these days, especially in the, the working class or certain aspects of the working class, there is little to no value placed in education anymore. What would you say to that? I find that very sad. Um, I think that um, a lot of people have abilities, but they may not um, have the opportunity to develop them, uh, particularly if their parents are against education. And uh, for an intelligent child, that is uh, a disaster, really, because they will get frustrated, they will turn to misbehavior, to breaking the law, to drugs, etc., etc., and that is not the as far as the country is concerned, it's a massive waste of people that could really help other people in life and develop, become scientists, become uh, politicians, true politicians, where they want to help other people. And therefore, that is a disaster. Education is very important and should be really prized. So do you think that attitude served you well, you ended up in a decent university in London and that's how you got the opportunity to work in the field you did? Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, I went into banking and I went into banking because I had to leave school and I had to earn money because my mother and I were living in poverty, literally. And so I had to go out and learn, earn, sorry, earn money. Um, um, I continued with my studies. I took all my banking exams to the level that I finished them at a very young age. I then took A-levels to get to university and I, I went as a mature student. But fortunately, uh, my mother at that time had uh, inherited some mother money from her father and so I was able to leave her. Up to then, I was hoping to support her. Question four. Then you decided to go to university late as a mature student to study economics. Why did you do that? 
but at university, I think you face further disruption. Can you tell us about that too, please? Yes, um, I studied some economics in my banking exams, and I got quite interested in the subject. So my mother had inherited money from my grandfather, and I was then free to leave home. I didn't have to support her anymore financially. So I decided to go and read for a degree in economics at London University. Um, I was a mature student. By then I was 23, 24, and my friends were naturally of my own age group, and they were reading further for further degrees or for doctorates. And I found that I had to pull my mind up to meet their capabilities as they were extremely intelligent, sophisticated people. And coming from the backwards, if you like, it really was quite a struggle to, to talk to them and to be part of their milieu, if you like, of their, of their circle. But I succeeded on that. Of course, I was at university in the late 1960s, and that was a time of great disruption in the universities, not only in places like uh, London, but in Paris, <coughs> in America, there were student riots, student demonstrations, and that happened in my university as well. In fact, uh, my school was closed down for a whole term and was occupied by the Metropolitan Police because of the action of certain uh, people in the student body that were supposedly communists, but uh, they were after their own interests. They were Marxists, they called themselves Marxists or Leninists or Trotskyists. Uh, but they disrupted the, the situation for all the other students and made things very difficult for them. What parallels do you draw between that experience, those times, and the times we're living through at the moment? I think that um, radicalization, which I saw at university, is a common theme. We talked about, we, people talk about radicalization, but they haven't actually experienced it, whereas I saw it. I mean, the leaders of radicalization usually are um, the elite. They are very often the more intelligent and the better off of society. I mean, most of the students, leaders that I saw had gone to private schools. My parents had paid their fees. Um, they came from well-off families. I always used to say that they were rich enough to be communists. They could afford to be communists. And they were the, as Marx would say, uh, the, uh, the leadership of the proletariat, as far as they were concerned. And they recruited other students who were not so intelligent, who did not come from such privileged backgrounds, and provided them with cannon fodder. Cannon fodder because they put these students up, they got the numbers to be able to get there for to be able to demonstrate. But behind it all were these, these elite uh, people who were, really didn't believe in what they were preaching but managed to convince other people that this was the case and they should follow them. It's interesting you say that because obviously we have the woke movement at the moment, which is essentially the result of what you saw start in the 60s. Mm. So over the decades, it seems like the movements that you saw start have fully got a grip on the education system and have taken over completely. It's almost like it's been a 60 year plan and now they have almost complete control over the education system. What warnings would you give um, against allowing what happened in the 60s to happen again? First of all, I think that the woke movement is based itself more on a liberal ideology. Um, it's no longer actually Marxist, although ideologies are ideologies, and it is an ideology. Wokeism is, of course, prevalent here and in other countries. As it, but of course, the United States took the uh, took the lead on this, if you like. Um, I would caution against that. I think um, that it can be um, uh, 
lead to extremism. However, I do believe in young people. And if you look at um, what, a little bit of history, you can find that after the Marxist period, there was a reaction in the student body against that period. And I think the same will apply with wokeism. I think that these young people will be taught in the schools this ideology, but when they get out into the the world and get to university, I think they will start to revolt against it. I think they will, uh, as young people naturally do, will go against what they've actually been taught. That's my hope. <laughs> That's a definite hope. It does actually look like it's starting to happen as well, Good. because of the sheer damage that wolfism is doing yeah. in, in America particularly.